The Nigerian Civil War, commonly known as the Biafran War, the 6th of July 1967 to the 15th of January 1970, was a war fought between the government of Nigeria and the secessionist state of Biafra. Biafra represented nationalist aspirations of the Igbo people, whose leadership felt they could no longer coexist with the northern-dominated federal government. The conflict resulted from political, economic, ethnic, cultural and religious tensions which preceded Britain's formal decolonization of Nigeria from 1960 to 1963. Immediate causes of the war in 1966 included a military coup, a counter-coup and persecution of Igbo living in northern Nigeria. Control over the lucrative oil production in the Niger Delta played a vital strategic role. Within a year, the federal government troops surrounded Biafra, capturing coastal oil facilities and the city of Port Harcourt. The blockade imposed during the ensuing stalemate led to severe famine. During the two and a half years of the war, there were about 100,000 overall military casualties, while between 500,000 and 2 million Biafran civilians died of starvation. In mid 1968, images of malnourished and starving Biafran children saturated the mass media of Western countries. The plight of the starving Biafrans became a cause célèbre in foreign countries, enabling a significant rise in the funding and prominence of international non-governmental organizations (NGOs). Britain and the Soviet Union were the main supporters of the Nigerian government in Lagos, while France, Israel and some other countries supported Biafra. France and Israel provided weapons to both combatants. Topic: Background Ethnic division The Civil War can be connected to the British colonial amalgamation in 1914 of northern and southern Nigeria. Intended for better administration due to the close proximity of these protectorates, the change did not account for the great difference in the cultures and religions of the peoples in each area. After the amalgamation, oil was discovered in eastern Nigeria, now southern Nigeria. Competition for its associated wealth led to the struggle for control amongst the regions. As southern Nigeria was not as united as the north, it was disadvantaged in the power struggle. In July 1966 northern officers staged a counter-coup to revenge on the easterners for the targeting their own political leaders in the first coup, Lt. Col. Yakubu Goen emerged as the head of state. During his tenure, killing of Easterners in the north continued. Several retaliatory actions took place, eventually resulting in the Biafran War. Nigeria gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1960, but remained in the Commonwealth of Nations, composed of 53 former UK colonies. In 1960, Nigeria had a population of 60 million people, made up of more than 300 differing ethnic and cultural groups. More than 50 years earlier, the United Kingdom had carved an area out of West Africa containing hundreds of different ethnic groups and unified it, calling it Nigeria. The three predominant groups were the Igbo, which formed between 60-70% of the population in the southeast, the Hausa Fulani, which formed about 65% of the population in the northern part of the territory, and the Yoruba, which formed about 75% of the population in the southwestern part. Although these groups have their own homelands, by the 1960s, the people were dispersed across Nigeria, with all three ethnic groups represented substantially in major cities. When the war broke out in 1967, there were still 5,000 Igbos in Lagos. The semi feudal and Islamic Hausa Fulani in the north were traditionally ruled by a feudal, conservative Islamic hierarchy consisting of emirs who, in turn, owed their allegiance to a supreme sultan. This sultan was regarded as the source of all political power and religious authority. The Yoruba political system in the southwest, like that of the House of Fulani, also consisted of a series of monarchs, the Oba. The Yoruba monarchs, however, were less autocratic than those in the north. The political and social system of the Yoruba accordingly allowed for greater upward mobility, based on acquired rather than inherited wealth and title. In contrast to the two other groups, the Igbo in the southeast lived mostly in autonomous, democratically organized communities, although there were Ease or monarchs in many of the ancient cities, such as the Kingdom of Nri. In its zenith the kingdom controlled most of Igbo land, including influence on the Anioma people, Arachukwu which controlled slavery in Igbo, and Anitsha land. 
Unlike the other two regions, decisions within the Igbo communities were made by a general assembly in which men and women participated. The differing political systems among these three peoples reflected and produced divergent customs and values. The House of Fulani commoners, having contact with the political system only through a village head designated by the emir or one of his subordinates, did not view political leaders as amenable to influence. Political decisions were to be submitted to. As with all other authoritarian religious and political systems, leadership positions were given to persons willing to be subservient and loyal to superiors. A chief function of this political system in this context was to maintain conservative values, which caused many Hausa Fulani to view economic and social innovation as subversive or sacrilegious. In contrast to the Hausa Fulani, the Igbo often participated directly in the decisions which affected their lives. They had a lively awareness of the political system and regarded it as an instrument for achieving their personal goals. Status was acquired through the ability to arbitrate disputes that might arise in the village, and through acquiring rather than inheriting wealth. The Igbo had been substantially victimized in the Atlantic slave trade. In the year 1790, it was reported that of 20,000 people sold each year from Bani, 16,000 were Igbo. With their emphasis upon social achievement and political participation, the Igbo adapted to and challenged colonial rule in innovative ways. These tradition-derived differences were perpetuated and perhaps enhanced by the British system of colonial rule in Nigeria. In the north, the British found it convenient to rule indirectly through the emirs, thus perpetuating rather than changing the indigenous authoritarian political system. Christian missionaries were excluded from the north, and the area thus remained virtually closed to European cultural imperialism. By contrast the richest of the Igbo often sent their sons to British universities, thinking to prepare them to work with the British. During the ensuing years, the northern emirs maintained their traditional political and religious institutions, while reinforcing their social structure. At the time of independence in 1960, the north was by far the most underdeveloped area in Nigeria. It had an English literacy rate of 2%, as compared to 19.2% in the East literacy in Ajami local languages in Arabic script, learned in connection with religious education, was much higher. The West also enjoyed a much higher literacy level, as it was the first part of the country to have contact with Western education, and established a free primary education program under the pre independence Western regional government. In the South, the missionaries rapidly introduced Western forms of education. Consequently, the Yoruba were the first group in Nigeria to adopt Western bureaucratic social norms. They made up the first classes of African civil servants, doctors, lawyers, and other technicians and professionals. In Igbo areas, missionaries were introduced at a later date because of British difficulty in establishing firm control over the highly autonomous Igbo communities. However, the Igbo people actively took to Western education, and they overwhelmingly came to adopt Christianity. Population pressure in the Igbo homeland, combined with aspirations for monetary wages, drove thousands of Igbos to other parts of Nigeria in search of work. By the 1960s, Igbo political culture was more unified and the region relatively prosperous, with tradesmen and literate elites active not just in the traditionally Igbo South, but throughout Nigeria. By 1966, the ethnic and religious differences between Northerners and the Igbo had combined with additional stratification by virtue of education and economic class. Topic: <laughs> Politics and Economics of Federalism. The British colonial ideology that divided Nigeria into three regions, North, West and East, exacerbated the already well-developed economic, political, and social differences among Nigeria's different ethnic groups. The country was divided in such a way that the North had a slightly higher population than the other two regions combined. On this basis the Northern region was allocated a majority of the seats in the federal legislature established by the colonial authorities. Within each of the three regions the dominant ethnic groups, the House of Fulani, Yoruba, and Igbo, respectively formed political parties that were largely regional and based on ethnic allegiances, the Northern People's Congress NPC in the North, the Action Group in the West AG, and the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons NCNC in the East. These parties were not exclusively homogeneous in terms of their ethnic or regional makeup. The disintegration of Nigeria resulted largely from the fact that these parties were primarily based in one region and one tribe. 
To simplify matters, we will refer to them here as the Hausa, Yoruba, and Ibo-based, or Northern, Western and Eastern parties. The basis of modern Nigeria formed in 1914, when Britain amalgamated the Northern and Southern protectorates. Beginning with the Northern Protectorate, the British implemented a system of indirect rule of which they exerted influence through alliances with local forces. This system worked so well, colonial governor Frederick Lugard successfully lobbied to extend it to the Southern Protectorate through amalgamation. In this way, a foreign and hierarchical system of governance was imposed on the Igbos along with many other smaller groups in the South, intellectuals began to agitate for greater rights and independence. The size of this intellectual class increased significantly in the 1950s, with the massive expansion of the national education program. During the 1940s and 1950s the Igbo and Yoruba parties were in the forefront of the fight for independence from Britain. They also wanted an independent Nigeria to be organized into several small states so that the conservative north would not dominate the country. Northern leaders, fearful that independence would mean political and economic domination by the more westernized elites in the south, preferred the perpetuation of British rule. As a condition for accepting independence, they demanded that the country continue to be divided into three regions with the north having a clear majority. Igbo and Yoruba leaders, anxious to obtain an independent country at all costs, accepted the northern demands. However, it would be wrong to state that the two southern regions were politically or philosophically aligned and there was already discordance between the two southern political parties. Firstly, the AG favored a loose confederacy of regions in the emergent Nigerian nation whereby each region would be in total control of its own distinct territory. The status of Lagos was a sore point for the AG which did not want Lagos, a Yoruba town which was at that time the federal capital and seat of national government to be designated as the capital of Nigeria if it meant loss of Yoruba suzerainty. The AG insisted that Lagos, a Yoruba city situated in western Nigeria must be completely recognized as a Yoruba town without any loss of identity, control or autonomy by the Yoruba. Contrary to this position, the NCNC was anxious to declare Lagos, by virtue of it being the federal capital territory, as no man's land. A declaration which as could be expected angered the AG which offered to help fund the development of other territory in Nigeria as federal capital territory, and then threatened secession from Nigeria if it didn't get its way. The threat of secession by the AG was tabled, documented and recorded in numerous constitutional conferences, including the Constitutional Conference held in London in 1954 with the demand that a right of secession be enshrined in the constitution of the emerging Nigerian nation to allow any part of the emergent nation to opt out of Nigeria, should the need arise. Authors, Tekina N. Tamunozors, The Journal of Modern African Studies, Volume 8, No. 4 Dec. 1970, pp. 563-584 this proposal for inclusion of right of secession by the regions in independent Nigeria by the AG was rejected and resisted by NCNC which vehemently argued for a tightly bound united, unitary structured nation because it viewed the provision of a secession clause as detrimental to the formation of a unitary Nigerian state. In the face of sustained opposition by the NCNC delegates, later joined by the NPC and backed by threats to view maintenance of the inclusion of secession by the AG as treasonable by the British, the AG was forced to renounce its position of inclusion of the right of secession a part of the Nigerian constitution. It should be noted that, had such a provision been made in the Nigerian constitution, later events which led to the Nigerian – Biafran civil war would have been avoided. The pre-independence alliance between the NCNC and the NPC against the aspirations of the AG would later set the tone for political governance of independent Nigeria by the NCNC, NPC and lead to disaster in later years in Nigeria. Northern-Southern tension manifested on 1 May 1953, as fighting in the northern city of Kano. The political parties tended to focus on building power in their own regions, resulting in an incoherent and disunified dynamic in the federal government. In 1946, the British divided the southern region into the western region and the eastern region. Each government was entitled to collect royalties from resources extracted within its area. This changed in 1956 when Shell BP found large petroleum deposits in the eastern region. A commission led by Jeremy Raisman and Ronald Tress determined that resource royalties would now enter a distributable pools account, with the money split between different parts of government 50% to region of origin, 20% to federal government, 30% to other regions. 
To ensure continuing influence, the British promoted unity in the Northern Bloc and discord among and within the two southern regions, as well as the creation of a new mid-western region in an area with oil potential. The new constitution of 1946 also proclaimed that the entire property in and control of all mineral oils, in, under, or upon any lands, in Nigeria, and of all rivers, streams, and watercourses throughout Nigeria, is and shall be vested in, the Crown." Britain profited significantly from a fivefold rise in Nigerian exports amidst the post-war economic boom. <laughs> First Republic Nigeria's First Republic came into being on 1 October 1960. The first Prime Minister of Nigeria, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, was a northerner and co-founder of the Northern People's Congress. He formed an alliance with the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons Party, and its popular nationalist leader Namdi Zik Azikiwa, who became Governor-General and then President. The Yoruba Aligned Action Group, the third major party, played the opposition role. Workers became increasingly aggrieved by low wages and bad conditions, especially when they compared their lot to the lifestyles of politicians in Lagos. Most wage earners lived in the Lagos area, and many lived in overcrowded, dangerous housing. Labor activity, including strikes, intensified in 1963, culminating in a nationwide general strike in June 1964. Strikers disobeyed an ultimatum to return to work and at one point were dispersed by riot police. Eventually, they did win wage increases. The strike included people from all ethnic groups. Retired Brigadier General H. M. Joku later wrote that the general strike heavily exacerbated tensions between the army and ordinary civilians, and put pressure on the army to take action against a government which was widely perceived as corrupt. The 1964 elections, which involved heavy campaigning all year, brought ethnic and regional divisions into focus. Resentment of politicians ran high, and many campaigners feared for their safety while touring the country. The army repeatedly deployed to TIV division, killing hundreds and arresting thousands of TIV people agitating for self-determination. Widespread reports of fraud tarnished the election's legitimacy. Westerners especially resented the political domination of the Northern People's Congress, many of whose candidates ran unopposed in the election. Violence spread throughout the country and some began to flee the North and West, some to Dahomey. The apparent domination of the political system by the North, and the chaos breaking out across the country, motivated elements within the military to consider decisive action. Britain maintained its economic hold on the country, through continued alliance and reinforcement of the Northern Bloc. In addition to Shell BP, the British reaped profits from mining and commerce. The British owned United Africa Company alone controlled 41.3% of all Nigeria's foreign trade. At 516,000 barrels per day, Nigeria had become the 10th biggest oil exporter in the world. Topic: <inaudible> Military coups. On the 15th of January 1966, Major Emmanuel Ifeajuna and other junior army officers, mostly majors and captains, attempted a coup d'état. The two major political leaders of the North, the Prime Minister, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa and the Premier of the Northern Region, Sir Amadou Bello were executed by Major Naziagwu. Also murdered was Sir Amadou Bello's wife and officers of Northern Extraction. Meanwhile, the President, Sir Namdi Azikiwa, and Igbo, was on an extended vacation in the West Indies. He did not return until days after the coup. There was widespread suspicion that the Igbo coup plotters had tipped him and other Igbo leaders off regarding the impending coup. In addition to the killings of the northern political leaders, the premier of the western region, Ladok Akintala and Yoruba senior military officers were also killed. The coup, also referred to as the coup of the five majors, has been described in some quarters as Nigeria's only revolutionary coup. This was the first coup in the short life of Nigeria's nascent second democracy. Claims of electoral fraud were one of the reasons given by the coup plotters. This coup was however seen not as a revolutionary coup by other sections of Nigerians, especially in the northern and western sections and latter revisionists of Nigerian coups, mostly from eastern part of Nigeria have belatedly maintained to widespread disbelief amongst western and southern Nigerians that the majors sought to spring action group leader Obafemi Awolowo out of jail and make him head of the new government. From there, they would dismantle the northern-dominated power structure. 
However, their efforts to take power were thwarted by Johnson Aguiyi Ironsi, an Igbo and loyalist head of the Nigerian army, who suppressed coup operations in the south. The majors surrendered, and Aguiyi Ironsi was declared head of state on 16 January. Aguiyi Ironsi suspended the constitution and dissolved parliament. He then abolished the regional confederated form of government and pursued unitary-like policies Hithato favored by the NCNC, having apparently been influenced by some NCNC political philosophy. He, however, appointed Colonel Hassan Katsina, son of Katsina Amir Usman Nagogo, to govern the northern region, indicating some willingness to maintain cooperation with this bloc. He also preferentially released northern politicians from jail, enabling them to plan his forthcoming overthrow. Aguyi Ironsi rejected a British offer of military support but promised to protect British interests. However, Britain participated in overthrow. Ironsi fatally did not bring the failed plotters to trial as required by then military law and as advised by most northern and western officers. Rather, coup plotters were maintained in the military on full pay and some were even promoted while apparently awaiting trial. The coup, despite its failure and since no repercussion was meted out to coup plotters and since no significant Igbo political leaders were affected was widely perceived as having benefited mostly the Igbo. Most of the known coup plotters were Igbo and the military and political leadership of western and northern regions had been largely bloodily eliminated while eastern military, political leadership was largely untouched. However Ironsi, himself an Igbo, was thought to have made numerous attempts to please northerners. The other event that also fueled the so-called Igbo conspiracy was the killing of northern leaders, and the killing of the Brigadier Ademulgun's pregnant wife by the coup executioners. Despite the overwhelming contradictions of the coup being executed by mostly northern soldiers such as John Adam K. Para, later military governor of Banu State, the killing of Igbo soldier Lt. Col. Arthur Unegbi by coup executioners, and Ironsi's termination of an Igbo-led coup, the ease by which Ironsi stopped the coup led to suspicion that the Igbo coup plotters planned all along to pave the way for Ironsi to take the reins of power in Nigeria. Colonel Odamegwu Ojukwu became military governor of the eastern region at this time. On 24 May 1966, the military government issued Unification Decree No. 34, which would have replaced the federation with a more centralized system. The Northern Bloc found this decree intolerable. In the face of provocation from the Eastern media which repeatedly showed humiliating posters and cartoons of the slain Northern politicians, on the night of 29 July 1966, Northern soldiers at Abiokuta barracks mutinied, thus precipitating a counter-coup, which have already been in the planning stages. The counter-coup led to the installation of Lt. Col. Yakubu Goen as Supreme Commander of the Nigerian Armed Forces. Goen was chosen as a compromise candidate. He was a northerner, a Christian, from a minority tribe, and had a good reputation within the army. It seems that Goen immediately faced not only a potential standoff with the east, but secession threats from the northern and even the western region. The counter-coup plotters had considered using the opportunity to withdraw from the Federation themselves. Ambassadors from Britain and the United States, however, urged Goen to maintain control over the whole country. Goen followed this plan, repealing the unification decree, announcing a return to the federal system. Topic. Persecution of Igbo From June through October 1966, pogroms in the north killed an estimated 80,000 to 100,000 Igbo, half of them children, and caused more than a million to two million to flee to the eastern region. The 29th of September 1966 was considered the worst day because of massacres. It was called Black Thursday. Ethnomusicologist Charles Kyle, who was visiting Nigeria in 1966, recounted. The pogroms I witnessed in Makurdi, Nigeria late September 1966 were foreshadowed by months of intensive anti-IBO and anti-Eastern conversations among TIV, Idoma, Hausa and other northerners resident in Makurdi, and, fitting a pattern replicated in city after city, the massacres were led by the Nigerian army. Before, during and after the slaughter, call. Goan could be heard over the radio issuing guarantees of safety to all Easterners, all citizens of Nigeria, but the intent of the soldiers, the only power that counts in Nigeria now or then, was painfully clear. After counting the disemboweled bodies along the Makurdi Road I was escorted back to the city by soldiers who apologized for the stench and explained politely that they were doing me and the world a great favor by eliminating IBOs. 
The federal military government also laid the groundwork for the blockade of the eastern region which went into full effect in 1967. Breakaway On 27 May 1967, Goan proclaimed the division of Nigeria into 12 states. This decree carved the eastern region in three parts, southeastern state, rivers state, and east central state. Now the Igbos, concentrated in the East Central State, would lose control over most of the petroleum, located in the other two areas. On 30 May 1967, Ojukwu declared independence of the Republic of Biafra. The federal military government immediately placed an embargo on all shipping to and from Biafra but not on oil tankers. Biafra quickly moved to collect oil royalties from oil companies doing business within its borders. When Shell BP acquiesced to this request at the end of June, the federal government extended its blockade to include oil. The blockade, which most foreign actors accepted, played a decisive role in putting Biafra at a disadvantage from the beginning of the war. Although the very young nation had a chronic shortage of weapons to go to war, it was determined to defend itself. Although there was much sympathy in Europe and elsewhere, only five countries Tanzania, Gabon, Côte d'Ivoire, Zambia, and Haiti officially recognized the new republic. Britain supplied amounts of heavy weapons and ammunition to the Nigerian side because of its desire to preserve the country it had created. The Biafra side received arms and ammunition from France even though French government denied sponsoring Biafra. An article in Paris Match of 20 November 1968 claimed that French arms were reaching Biafra through neighbouring countries such as Gabon. The heavy supply of weapons by Britain was the biggest factor in determining the outcome of the war. Several peace accords were held, with the most notable one held at Abury, Ghana the Abury Accord. There were different accounts on what took place in Abury. Ojukwu accused the federal government of going back on their promises while the federal government accused Ojukwu of distortion and half-truths. Ojukwu gained agreement to a confederation for Nigeria, rather than a federation. He was warned by his advisors that this reflected a failure of Goan to understand the difference and, that being the case, predicted that it would be reneged upon. When this happened, Ojukwu regarded it as both a failure by Goan to keep to the spirit of the Abari Agreement, and lack of integrity on the side of the Nigerian military government in the negotiations toward a united Nigeria. Goan's advisers, to the contrary, felt that he had enacted as much as was politically feasible in fulfillment of the spirit of Abari. The eastern region was very ill-equipped for war, outmanned and outgunned by the Nigerians. Their advantages included fighting in their homeland, support of most Easterners, determination, and use of limited resources. The UK which still maintained the highest level of influence over Nigeria's highly valued oil industry through Shell BP and the Soviet Union supported the Nigerian government, especially by military supplies. War Shortly after extending its blockade to include oil, the Nigerian government launched a police action to retake the secessionist territory. The war began on the early hours of 6 July 1967 when Nigerian federal troops advanced in two columns into Biafra. The Biafra strategy had succeeded. The federal government had started the war, and the East was defending itself. The Nigerian army offensive was through the north of Biafra led by Colonel Mohamed Shuwa and the local military units were formed as the 1st Infantry Division. The division was led mostly by northern officers. After facing unexpectedly fierce resistance and high casualties, the right-hand Nigerian column advanced on the town of Nsukka, which fell on 14 July, while the left-hand column made for Garkham, which was captured on 12 July. Biafran Offensive The Biafrans responded with an offensive of their own when, on 9 August, the Biafran forces moved west into the mid-western Nigerian region across the Niger River, passing through Benin City, until they were stopped at Or in present-day Ondo State just over the state boundary on 21 August, just 130 miles east of the Nigerian capital of Lagos. The Biafran attack was led by Lt. Col. Banjo, a Yoruba, with the Biafran rank of brigadier. The attack met little resistance and the Midwest was easily taken over. This was due to the pre-secession arrangement that all soldiers should return to their regions to stop the spate of killings, in which Igbo soldiers had been major victims. 
The Nigerian soldiers who were supposed to defend the Midwest state were mostly Midwest Igbo and, while some were in touch with their eastern counterparts, others resisted. General Gowen responded by asking Colonel Murtala Muhammad who later became head of state in 1975 to form another division, the Second Infantry division to expel the Biafrans from the Midwest, as well as to defend the west side and attack Biafra from the west as well. As Nigerian forces retook the Midwest, the Biafran military administrator declared the Republic of Benin on 19 September, though it ceased to exist the next day. The present country of Benin, west of Nigeria, was still named Dahomey at that time. Although Benin City was retaken by the Nigerians on the 22nd of September, the Biafrans succeeded in their primary objective by tying down as many Nigerian federal troops as they could. General Gowen also launched an offensive into Biafra south from the Niger Delta to the Riverine area, using the bulk of the Lagos Garrison Command under Colonel Benjamin Adekunle called the Black Scorpion to form the 3rd Infantry Division which was later renamed as the 3rd Marine Commando. As the war continued, the Nigerian army recruited amongst a wider area, including the Yoruba, Itshakiri, Yorhobo, Edo, Ija, etc. Nigerian offensive. The command was divided into two brigades with three battalions each. First brigade advanced one brigade advanced on the Axis Ogugu, Ogunga, N. Sukka Road while second brigade advanced on Axis Gekama Budu, Ogoha Road. By 10 July 1967, it had conquered all its assigned territories. By 12 July the second brigade had captured Gekam, Ogadu, Ogoha. Anugu became the hub of secession and rebellion, and the Nigerian government believed that once Anugu was captured, the drive for secession would end. The plans to conquer Anugu began on 12 September 1967 and by 4 October 1967 the Nigerian army had captured Anugu. Nigerian soldiers under Murtala Muhammad carried out a mass killing of 700 civilians when they captured Asaba on the river Niger. The Nigerians were repulsed three times as they attempted to cross the River Niger during October, resulting in the loss of thousands of troops, dozens of tanks and equipment. The first attempt by the 2nd Infantry Division on 12 October to cross the Niger from the town of Asaba to the Biafran city of Anitsha cost the Nigerian Federal Army over 5,000 soldiers killed, wounded, captured or missing. Operation Tiger Claw 17 to 20 October 1967 was a military conflict between Nigerian and Biafran military forces. On the 17th of October 1967 Nigerians invaded Calabar led by the Black Scorpion Benjamin Adekunle while the Biafrans were led by Col OGBU OGI, who was responsible for controlling the area between Calabar and Opobo and Lynn Garrison a foreign mercenary. The Biafrans came under immediate fire from the water and the air. For the next two days Biafran stations and military supplies were bombarded by the Nigerian Air Force. That same day Lynn Garrison reached Calabar but came under immediate fire by federal troops. By 20 October, Garrison's forces withdrew from the battle while Col. OGI officially surrendered to Gen. Adekunle. On 19 May 1968 Portharcourt was captured. With the capture of Anugu, Bani, Calabar and Portharcourt, the outside world was left in no doubt of the federal supremacy in the war. Topic. Control over oil production Oil exploration in Nigeria was pioneered by Shell BP Petroleum Development Company in 1937. In a bid to control the oil in the eastern region, the federal government placed a shipping embargo on the territory. This embargo did not involve oil tankers. The leadership of Biafra wrote to Shell BP demanding royalties for the oil that was being explored in their region. After much deliberation, Shell BP decided to pay Biafra the sum of £250,000. The news of this payment reached the federal government, which immediately extended the shipping embargo to oil tankers. The Nigerian government also made it clear to Shell BP that it expected the company to pay all outstanding oil royalty immediately. With the stalling on the payment for Biafra government asked Shell BP to stop operations in Biafra and took over from the company. Towards the end of July 1967, Nigerian federal troops and marines captured Bonny Island in the Niger Delta, thereby taking control of vital Shell BP facilities. Operations began again in May 1968, when Nigeria captured Port Harcourt. 
Its facilities had been damaged and needed repair. Oil production and export continued, but at a lower level. The completion in 1969 of a new terminal at Forcados brought production up from 142,000 barrels per day in 1958 to 540,000 barrels per day in 1969. In 1970, this figure doubled to 1,080,000 barrels per day. The royalties enabled Nigeria to buy more weapons, hire mercenaries, etc. Biafra proved unable to compete on this economic level. Topic. Atrocities against ethnic minorities in Biafra Minorities in Biafra suffered atrocities at the hands of those fighting for both sides of the conflict. The pogroms in the north in 1966 were indiscriminately directed against people from eastern Nigeria. Despite a seemingly natural alliance among these victims of the pogroms in the north, tensions rose as minorities, who had always harbored an interest in having their own state within the Nigerian Federation, were suspected of collaborating with federal troops to undermine Biafra. The federal troops were equally culpable of this crime. In the rivers area, ethnic minorities sympathetic to Biafra were killed in the hundreds by federal troops. In Calabar, some 2,000 EFICs were also killed by federal troops. Outside of the Biafra, atrocities were recorded against the resident of Asaba in present-day Delta State by both sides of the conflict. <laughs> <laughs> International involvement <laughs> <laughs> Britain The British planned to maintain and expand their supply of cheap high-quality oil from Nigeria. Therefore they placed a high priority on maintenance of oil extraction and refining operations. They backed the federal government but, when the war broke out, cautioned them not to damage British oil installations in the east. These oil works, under the control of Shell BP Petroleum Development Company jointly owned by Shell and British Petroleum, controlled 84% of Nigeria's 580,000 barrels per day. Two-thirds of this oil came from the eastern region, and another third from the newly created Midwest region. Two-fifths of all Nigerian oil ended up in Britain. Shell BP therefore considered carefully a request by the federal government that it refuse to pay the royalties demanded by Biafra. Its lawyers advised that payment to Biafra would be appropriate if this government did in fact maintain law and order in the region in question. The British government advised that paying Biafra could undermine the goodwill of the federal government. Shell BP made the payment, and the government established a blockade on oil exports. Forced to choose a side, Shell BP and the British government threw in their lot with the federal government in Lagos, apparently calculating that this side would be more likely to win the war. As the British High Commissioner in Lagos wrote to the Secretary of State for Commonwealth Affairs on 27 July 1967, Ojukwu, even victorious, will not be in a strong position. He will require all the international help and recognition he can get. The federal government would be much better placed both internationally and internally. They would have a cast iron case for the severest treatment of a company which has subsidized a rebel, and I feel fairly convinced they would press their case to the lengths of cancelling the company's concessions and nationalizing their installations. I conclude, therefore, if the company does change its mind and asks the British government for advice, the best that could be given is for it to clamber hastily back on the Lagos side of the fence with check book at the ready. Shell BP took this advice. It continued to quietly support Nigeria through the rest of the war, in one case advancing a royalty of £5.5 million to fund the purchase of more British weapons. During the war, Britain covertly supplied Nigeria with weapons and military intelligence and may have also helped it to hire mercenaries. After the decision was made to back Nigeria, the BBC oriented its reporting to favour this side. Supplies provided to the federal military government included two vessels and 60 vehicles. In Britain, the humanitarian campaign around Biafra began on the 12th of June 1968 with media coverage on ITV and in the Sun. The charities Oxfam and Save the Children Fund were soon deployed with large sums of money at their disposal. Topic: <laughs> France France provided weapons, mercenary fighters, and other assistance to Biafra and promoted its cause internationally, describing the situation as a genocide. Charles de Gaulle referred to Biafra's just and noble cause. However, France did not recognize Biafra diplomatically. 
Through Pierre Loris, France had apparently provided two B 26s, Alouette helicopters, and pilots. France supplied Biafra with captured German and Italian weapons from World War II, sans serial numbers, delivered as part of regular shipments to Côte d'Ivoire. France also sold Panard armored vehicles to the Nigerian federal government. French involvement in the war can be viewed in the context of its geopolitical strategy and competition with the English in West Africa. Nigeria represented a base of British influence in the predominantly French aligned area. France and Portugal used nearby countries in their sphere of influence, especially Côte d'Ivoire under President Félix Houphouet Boigny, as waystations for shipments to Biafra. To some extent, also, France repeated its earlier policy from the Congo crisis, when it supported the secession of the southern mining province Katanga. Economically, France gained incentives through oil drilling contracts for the Société Anonyme Française de Recherches et d'Exploitation de Petroliers, apparently arranged with eastern Nigeria in advance of its secession from the Nigerian Federation. SAFRAP laid claim to 7% of the Nigerian petroleum supply. In the assessment of a CIA analyst in 1970, France's support was actually given to a handful of Biafran bourgeoisie in return for the oil. Biafra, for its part, openly appreciated its relationship with France. Ojukwu suggested on 10 August 1967, that Biafra introduce compulsory French classes in secondary, technical and teacher training schools, in order to benefit from the rich culture of the French-speaking world. France led the way, internationally, for political support of Biafra. Portugal also sent weapons. These transactions were arranged through the Biafran Historical Research Centre in Paris. French-aligned Gabon and Côte d'Ivoire recognized Biafra in May 1968. On 8 May 1968, de Gaulle personally contributed 30,000 francs to medicine purchases for the French Red Cross mission. Fairly widespread student worker unrest diverted the government's attention only temporarily. The government declared an arms embargo but maintained arms shipments to Biafra under cover of humanitarian aid. In July the government redoubled its efforts to involve the public in a humanitarian approach to the conflict. Images of starving children and accusations of genocide filled French newspapers and television programs. Amidst this press blitz, on 31 July 1968, de Gaulle made an official statement in support of Biafra. Maurice Robert, head of service de documentation extérieure et de contre-espionnage the French Foreign Intelligence Service African Operations, wrote in 2004 that his agency supplied the press with details about the war and told them to use the word «genocide». In their reporting, France declared «Biafra week». On 11 to 17 March 1969, centered on a two-franc raffle held by the French Red Cross. Soon after, de Gaulle terminated arms shipments, then resigned on the 27th of April 1969. Interim President Alain Poher fired General Jacques Fockert, the lead coordinator of France's Africa policy. Georges Pompidou rehired Fockert and resumed support for Biafra, including cooperation with the South African Secret Service to import more weapons. Topic. United States of America The United States officially declared neutrality, with U.S. Secretary of State Dean Rusk stating that, "...America is not in a position to take action as Nigeria is an area under British influence." Formally, the United States was neutral in the Civil War. Strategically, its interests aligned with the federal military government. The U.S. also saw value in its alliance with Lagos, and sought to protect $800 million in the assessment of the State Department worth of private investment. On 9 September 1968, United States presidential candidate Richard Nixon stated, Until now, efforts to relieve the Biafra people have been thwarted by the desire of central government of Nigeria to pursue total and unconditional victory and by the fear of the IBO people that surrender means wholesale atrocities and genocide. But genocide is what is taking place right now, and starvation is the grim reaper. When Nixon became president in 1969, he found there was little he could do to change the established stance aside from call for another round of peace talks. Despite this, he continued to personally support Biafra. Gulf Oil Nigeria, the third major player in Nigerian oil, was producing 9% of the oil coming out of Nigeria before the war began. 
Its operations were all located offshore of the federally controlled Midwestern Territory, therefore it continued to pay royalties to the federal government and its operations were mostly undisrupted. Topic: <inaudible> Soviet Union. The Soviet Union strongly backed the Nigerian government, emphasizing the similarity with the Congo situation. It consistently supplied Nigeria with weapons with the diplomatic disclaimer that these were strictly for cash on a commercial basis." In 1968, the USSR agreed to finance the Kanji Dam on the Niger somewhat upriver from the Delta. Soviet media outlets initially accused the British of cynically supporting the Biafran secession, then had to adjust these claims later when it turned out that Britain was in fact supporting the federal government. One explanation for Soviet sympathy with the federal military government was a shared opposition to internal secessionist movements. Before the war, the Soviets had seemed sympathetic to the Igbos. But Soviet Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin stated to their chagrin in October 1967 that, "...the Soviet people fully understand Nigeria's motives and its need to prevent the country from being dismembered." Reportedly, the war substantially improved Soviet-Nigerian diplomatic and trade relations, and Moskvich cars began to make appearances around Lagos. The USSR became a competitive importer of Nigerian cacao. Nigeria received support from the Soviet Union in form of aircraft. Topic: <inaudible> Israel. From early on, Israel perceived that Nigeria would be an important player in West African politics and saw good relations with Lagos as an important foreign policy objective. Nigeria and Israel established a linkage in 1957. In 1960 Britain allowed the creation of an Israeli diplomatic mission in Lagos, and Israel made a $10 million loan to the Nigerian government. Israel also developed a cultural relation with the Igbos based on possible shared traditions. These moves represented a significant diplomatic success given the Muslim orientation of the northern-dominated government. Some northern leaders disapproved of contact with Israel and banned Israelis from Maiduguri and Sokoto. Israel did not begin arms sales to Nigeria until after Aguyi Ironzi came to power in January 1966. This was considered an opportune time to develop this relationship with the federal government. Ram Nurgid became Israeli ambassador to Nigeria in January. Thirty tons of mortar rounds were delivered in April. The eastern region began seeking assistance from Israel in September 1966. Israel apparently turned down their requests repeatedly, although they may have put the Biafran representatives in contact with another arms dealer. In 1968, Israel began supplying the federal military government with arms about $500,000 worth, according to the U.S. State Department. Meanwhile, as elsewhere, the situation in Biafra became publicized as a genocide. The Knesset publicly debated this issue on 17 and the 22nd of July 1968, winning applause from the press for its sensitivity. Right-wing and left-wing political groups, and student activists, spoke for Biafra. In August 1968, the Israeli Air Force overtly sent 12 tons of food aid to a nearby site outside of Nigerian Biafran air space. Covertly, Mossad provided Biafra with $100,000 through Zurich and attempted an arms shipment. Soon after, Israel arranged to make clandestine weapons shipments to Biafra using Côte d'Ivoire transport planes. Topic: Other countries. Biafra appealed unsuccessfully for support from the Organization of African Unity, which member states generally did not want to support internal secessionist movements, although they received the support of African countries such as Tanzania, Zambia, Gabon and Côte d'Ivoire. Many African countries who were against separatism like Ethiopia and Egypt supported the Nigerian government in order to prevent inspiring revolts in their own countries. Biafra surrounded. From 1968 onward, the war fell into a form of stalemate, with Nigerian forces unable to make significant advances into the remaining areas of Biafran control due to stiff resistance and major defeats in Abagana, Arachukwu, Oguda, Umuahia, Operation Oau, Akat Ekpin, etc. 
But another Nigerian offensive from April to June 1968 began to close the ring around the Biafrans with further advances on the two northern fronts and the capture of Port Harcourt on 19 May 1968. The blockade of the surrounded Biafrans led to a humanitarian disaster when it emerged that there was widespread civilian hunger and starvation in the besieged Igbo areas. The Biafran government reported that Nigeria was using hunger and genocide to win the war, and sought aid from the outside world. Private groups in the U.S., led by Senator Ted Kennedy, responded. No one was ever held responsible for these killings. In September 1968, the Federal Army planned what Gowen described as the final offensive. Initially the final offensive was neutralized by Biafran troops by the end of the year after several Nigerian troops were routed in Biafran ambushes. In the latter stages, a southern FMG offensive managed to break through. However in 1969, the Biafrans launched several offensives against the Nigerians in their attempts to keep the Nigerians off balance starting in March when the 14th Division of the Biafran Army recaptured Oweri and moved towards Port Harcourt, but were halted just north of the city. In May 1969, Biafran commandos recaptured oil wells in Kwale. In July 1969, Biafran forces launched a major land offensive supported by foreign mercenary pilots continuing to fly in food, medical supplies and weapons. Most notable of the mercenaries was Swedish Count Carl Gustav von Rosen who led air attacks with five Malmo MFI-9 Miniswan small piston-engined aircraft, armed with rocket pods and machine guns. His Biafran Air Force consisted of three Swedes, von Rosen, Gunnar Haglund and Martin Lang. The other two pilots were Biafrans, Willie Murray Bruce and Augustus Opke. From the 22nd of May to the 8th of July 1969 Von Rosen's small force attacked Nigerian military airfields in Port Harcourt, Enugu, Benin City and Ugeli, destroying or damaging a number of Nigerian Air Force jets used to attack relief flights, including a few MiG-17s and three of Nigeria's six Ilyushin Il-28 bombers that were used to bomb Biafran villages and farms on a daily basis. Although the Biafran offensives of 1969 were a tactical success, the Nigerians soon recovered. The Biafran air attacks did disrupt the combat operations of the Nigerian Air Force, but only for a few months. In response to the Nigerian government using foreigners to lead some advances, the Biafran government also began hiring foreign mercenaries to extend the war. Only German-born Rolf Steiner a lieutenant call with the 4th Commandos, and Major Taffy Williams, a Welshman would remain for the duration. Nigeria deployed foreign aircraft, in the form of Soviet MiG-17 and IL-28 bombers. <laughs> <laughs> Humanitarian crisis The September massacres and subsequent Igbo withdrawal from northern Nigeria was the basis for the initial human rights petition to the UN to end genocide and provided a historical link to Biafran claims of genocide during the Nigerian Civil War. Awareness of a mounting crisis rose in 1968. Information spread especially through religious networks, beginning with alerts from missionaries. It did not escape the notice of worldwide Christian organizations that the Biafrans were Christian and the northern Nigerians controlling the federal government were Muslim. The famine was as a result of the blockade that the Nigerian government had imposed on the eastern region in the months leading up to secession. Frederick Forsyth, then a journalist in Nigeria and later a successful novelist, observed that the main problem was kwashiorkor, a protein deficiency. Prior to the Civil War, the main source of dietary protein was dried fish imported from Norway, which was supplemented by local hogs, chicken and eggs. The blockade prevented imports, and local protein supplies were quickly depleted. The national diet was now almost 100% starch. Many volunteer bodies organized the Biafran airlift which provided blockade-breaking relief flights into Biafra, carrying food, medicines, and sometimes according to some claims, weapons. More common was the claim that the arms-carrying aircraft would closely shadow eight aircraft, making it more difficult to distinguish between eight aircraft and military supply aircraft. The American community to keep Biafra alive stood apart from other organizations by quickly creating a broad strategy for pressuring the American government into taking a more active role in facilitating relief. Former Peace Corps volunteers who had recently returned from Nigeria and college students founded the American Committee in July 1968. 
The Peace Corps volunteers stationed in the eastern region developed strong friendships and identified as Igbo, which was prompted them to help the eastern region. One of the characters assisting Count Carl Gustav von Rosen was Lynn Garrison, an ex RCAF fighter pilot. He introduced the Count to a Canadian method of dropping bagged supplies to remote areas in Canada without losing the contents. He showed how one sack of food could be placed inside a larger sack before the supply drop. When the package hit the ground the inner sack would rupture while the outer one kept the contents intact. With this method many tons of food were dropped to many Biafrans who would otherwise have died of starvation. Bernard Kouchner was one of a number of French doctors who volunteered with the French Red Cross to work in hospitals and feeding centres in besieged Biafra. The Red Cross required volunteers to sign an agreement, which was seen by some like Kouchner and his supporters as being similar to a gag order, that was designed to maintain the organization's neutrality, whatever the circumstances. Kouchner and the other French doctors signed this agreement. After entering the country, the volunteers, in addition to Biafran health workers and hospitals, were subjected to attacks by the Nigerian army, and witnessed civilians being murdered and starved by the blockading forces. Kouchner also witnessed these events, particularly the huge number of starving children, and when he returned to France, he publicly criticized the Nigerian government and the Red Cross for their seemingly complicit behavior. With the help of other French doctors, Kouchner put Biafra in the media spotlight and called for an international response to the situation. These doctors, led by Kouchner, concluded that a new aid organization was needed that would ignore political, religious boundaries and prioritize the welfare of victims. They formed Le Comité de lutte contre le génocide au Biafra which in 1971 became Médecins sans frontières doctors without borders. The crisis brought about a large increase in prominence and funding of non-governmental organizations NGOs. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Media and public opinion. Media and public relations played a central role in the war, due to their influence on morale at home and the dynamics of international involvement. Both sides relied heavily on external support. Media campaigns focused on the plight of the Biafrans intensified internationally in the summer of 1968. By the Biafran leadership and then around the world, the pogroms and famine were classified as genocide and compared to the Holocaust, hypothetical Judaic origins of the Igbos were used to bolster comparisons with Jews in Germany. In the international press, Igbo refugee camps were compared to Nazi extermination camps, humanitarian appeals differed somewhat from place to place. In Britain, humanitarian aid used familiar discourses of imperial responsibility. In Ireland, advertisements appealed to shared Catholicism and experiences of civil war. Both of these appeals channeled older cultural values into support for the new model of international NGOs. In Israel, the Holocaust comparison was promoted, as was the theme of threat from hostile Muslim neighbors. The Biafran War bombarded Western culture with the trope of the starving African child. The Biafran famine took media coverage of disaster to a new level, enabled by the proliferation of television sets. The televised disaster and the rising NGOs mutually enhanced each other, NGOs maintained their own communications networks and played a significant role in shaping news coverage. Biafran elites studied Western propaganda techniques and released carefully constructed public communications in an intentional fashion. Biafran propagandists had the dual task of appealing to international public opinion, and maintaining morale and nationalist spirit domestically. Political cartoons were a preferred medium for publicizing simple interpretations of the war. Biafra also used push polling to insinuate messages about Nigeria's inherent bloodthirstiness. Novelist Chinua Achebe became a committed propagandist for Biafra, and one of its leading international advocates. On 29 May 1969, Bruce Mayrock, a student at Columbia University, set himself ablaze at the premises of the United Nations headquarters in New York to protest the genocide against the nation and people of Biafra. He died of his injuries the following day. <laughs> Kuala Oilfield Incident In May 1969 a company of Biafran commandos raided an oil field in Kuala and killed 11 Sapem workers and Agip technicians. They captured three Europeans unhurt and then at a nearby Akpe field development Biafran commandos surrounded and captured 15 more expatriate personnel. The captives included 14 Italians, three West Germans and one Lebanese. 
It was claimed that the foreigners were captured fighting alongside Nigerians against Biafran troops and that they assisted Nigerians in constructing roads to aid them in their operations against Biafra. They were tried by a Biafran court and sentenced to death. This incident caused an international uproar. In the month that followed Pope Paul VI, the governments of Italy, the United Kingdom and the United States of America mounted concerted pressure on Biafra. On 4 June 1969, after receiving a personal direct mail from the Pope, Ojukwu pardoned the foreigners. They were released to the special envoys sent by the governments of Ivory Coast and Gabon and left Biafra. <laughs> End of the war With increased British support, the Nigerian Federal Forces launched their final offensive against the Biafrans once again on 23 December 1969, with a major thrust by the 3rd Marine Commando Division. The division was commanded by Col. Olushigan Abasanjo who later became president twice, which succeeded in splitting the Biafran enclave into two by the end of the year. The final Nigerian offensive, named Operation Tailwind, was launched on 7 January 1970 with the 3rd Marine Commando Division attacking, and supported by the 1st Infantry Division to the north and the 2nd Infantry Division to the south. The Biafran towns of Oweri fell on 9 January, and Uli on of January. Only a few days earlier, Ojukwu fled into exile by plane to the Ivory Coast, leaving his deputy Philip Effing to handle the details of the surrender to General Yakubu Goen of the Federal Army on 13 January 1970. The surrender paper was signed on 14 January 1970 in Lagos and thus came the end of the civil war and renunciation of secession. The war finally ended a few days later, with the Nigerian forces advancing into the remaining Biafran-held territories, which was met with little resistance. After the war, Goen said, The tragic chapter of violence is just ended. We are at the dawn of national reconciliation. Once again we have an opportunity to build a new nation. My dear compatriots, we must pay homage to the fallen, to the heroes who have made the supreme sacrifice that we may be able to build a nation, great in justice, fair trade, and industry. <laughs> Reckoning and legacy <laughs> <laughs> Atrocities against Igbo The war cost the Igbos a great deal in terms of lives, money and infrastructure. It has been estimated that up to 3 million people may have died due to the conflict, most from hunger and disease caused by Nigerian forces. More than 2 million people died from the famine imposed deliberately through blockade throughout the war. Lack of medicine also contributed. Thousands of people starved to death every day as the war progressed. The International Committee of the Red Cross in September 1968 estimated 8,000 to 10,000 deaths from starvation each day. The leader of a Nigerian peace conference delegation said in 1968 that, Starvation is a legitimate weapon of war and we have every intention of using it against the rebels. This stance is generally considered to reflect the policy of the Nigerian government. The Federal Nigerian Army is accused of further atrocities including deliberate bombing of civilians, mass slaughter with machine guns, and rape. Topic. Ethnic minorities in Biafra Ethnic minorities made up approximately 40% of the Biafran population in 1966. The attitude of ethnic minorities in Biafra towards the conflict were initially divided early in the war, having suffered the same fate as Igbos in the north held the same fear and dread as Igbos. However, actions by Biafra authorities suggesting they favored the Igbo majority turned these attitudes negative. Great suspicion was directed towards ethnic minorities and opponents of Biafra, with combing exercises conducted to sift these communities for saboteurs, or sabo, as they were commonly branded. This brand was widely feared, as it generally resulted in death by the Biafran forces or even mobs. The accusation subjected entire communities to violence in the form of killings, rapes, kidnapping and internments in camps by Biafran forces. Biafran Organization of Freedom Fighter was a paramilitary organization set up by the civil defense group with instructions to suppress the enemy, and engaged in combing exercises in minority communities. 
Atrocities against ethnic minorities in Biafra Minorities in Biafra suffered atrocities at the hands of those fighting for both sides of the conflict. The pogroms in the north in 1966 were indiscriminately directed against people from eastern Nigeria. Despite a seemingly natural alliance between these victims of the pogroms in the north, tensions rose as minorities, who had always harbored an interest in having their own state within the Nigerian Federation, were suspected of collaborating with federal troops to undermine Biafra. The federal troops were equally culpable of this crime. In the Rivers area, ethnic minorities sympathetic to Biafra were killed in the hundreds by federal troops. In Calabar, some 2,000 Efics were also killed by federal troops. Outside of the Biafra, atrocities were recorded against the resident of Asaba in present-day Delta State by both sides of the conflict. Topic. Genocide question Most continue to argue that the Biafran War was a genocide, for which no perpetrators have been held accountable. Critics of this position suggest that Igbo leaders had some responsibility, but acknowledge that starvation policies were pursued deliberately and that accountability has not been sought for the 1966 pogroms. Biafra made a formal complaint of genocide against Igbos to the International Committee on the Investigation of Crimes of Genocide, which concluded that British colonial administrators were complicit in the process of fomenting ethnic hatred and violence, dating back to the Kano riots of 1953. With special reference to the Asaba massacre, Emma Akocha described the killings as the first black-on-black -black genocide. Ekwe Ekwe places significant blame on the British. Another reference to the war's consideration as a genocide would be to Bruce Mayrock. In the report, Mayrock, a 20-year-old student at Columbia University, set himself on fire in protest of the killings in Biafra and how they were being overlooked. He died as a result of the burns. While at Columbia, Mayrock worked as a photographer for the Spectator Sports Department. Members of the youth's family stated Friday that he had worked actively to protest the war in Biafra, writing letters about the war to the president and leading government figures. However, according to one rabbi, who said he was close to the family, the student believed that no one was listening. He was an idealistic young man deeply upset by the events in Biafra. The rabbi said. People were being killed and he felt no one was doing anything. That's why he did what he did. Topic. Reconstruction Reconstruction, helped by the oil money, was swift, however, the old ethnic and religious tensions remained a constant feature of Nigerian politics. Accusations were made of Nigerian government officials diverting resources meant for reconstruction in the former Biafran areas to their ethnic areas. Military government continued in power in Nigeria for many years, and people in the oil-producing areas claimed they were being denied a fair share of oil revenues. Laws were passed mandating that political parties could not be ethnically or tribally based, however, it has been hard to make this work in practice. Igbos who ran for their lives during the pogroms and war returned to find their positions had been taken over, and when the war was over the government did not feel any need to reinstate them, preferring to regard them as having resigned. This reasoning was also extended to Igbo-owned properties and houses. People from other regions were quick to take over any house owned by an Igbo, especially in the Port Harcourt area. The Nigerian government justified this by terming such properties abandoned. This, however, has led to a feeling of an injustice as the Nigerian government policies were seen as further economically disabling the Igbos even long after the war. Further feelings of injustice were caused by Nigeria changing its currency, so that Biafran supplies of pre-war Nigerian currency were no longer honored. At the end of the war, only N20 pounds was given to any Easterner regardless of the amount of money he or she had had in the bank. This was applied irrespective of their banking in pre-war Nigerian currency or Biafran currency. This was seen as a deliberate policy to hold back the Igbo middle class, leaving them with little wealth to expand their business interests. Topic. Fall of Biafra On 29 May 2000, The Guardian reported that President Olushigan Abasanjo commuted to retirement the dismissal of all military persons who fought for the breakaway state of Biafra during the Nigerian Civil War. In a national broadcast, he said that the decision was based on the principle that, "...justice must at all times be tempered with mercy." 
Biafra was more or less wiped off the map until its resurrection by the contemporary movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra. Chinua Achebe's last book, There Was a Country, A Personal History of Biafra, has also rekindled discussion of the war. Timeline 1841 – End of slave trade in Nigeria 1879 – Creation of United African Company, later Royal Niger Company 1885 – Berlin Conference of European Powers formalizes British claim to Oil Rivers Protectorate 1900 – British Crown assumes governance of Nigeria and part of Cameroon 1914–1 January, southern and northern regions amalgamated, though administered separately, under British colonial rule executed by Governor-General Frederick Lugard. 1941–14 August, Atlantic Charter issued by Britain and the United States promises self-determination and sovereignty for all peoples. 1946 – Richard's Constitution subdivides southern region into eastern region and western region, reasserts the Crown's ownership of all mineral oils in Nigeria. 1951 – August – National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons NCNC party calls for independence in 1956. 1953 – The 31st of March – Motion for independence in 1956 proposed by Anthony Enahoro in House of Representatives, supported by NCNC and Action Group AG parties. The Northern People's Congress proposes to delay. May – Kano riot of 1953 1956 – Shell BP expedition discovers major petroleum deposits in eastern region 1962 – 1 October – First Nigerian Republic established 1961 – Northern People's Conference wins 94% of seats in Nigeria's first parliamentary election 1964 – 1 – 13 June – General strike 30 30th of December parliamentary election 1965 October western region election 1966 the 15th of January first military coup Johnson Aguiyi Ironsi becomes military head of state the 24th of May unification decree number no. 34 June to October pogroms Igbo exodus the 29th of July, second military coup, Yakubu Goen becomes military head of state. 1967. 4 to 5 January, negotiations between Eastern Region and Federal Military Government result in Abari Accord. The 27th of May, Goen announces planned redistricting of Nigerian Federation. The 30th of May, Ojukwu declares independence of Republic of Biafra. 6 July, Nigeria invades Biafra Operation UNICORD. Late July, Nigeria captures Bani Island. 9 August, Biafra begins counterattack on Midwest region. 20 September, creation of short-lived Republic of Benin, capital, Benin City in Midwest region. 1–4 October, fall of Enugu, the Biafran capital. 4–12 October, first invasion of Initia. 7 October, Asaba Massacre 17–20 October, Operation Tiger Claw November, First International Committee of the Red Cross Relief Supplies appear in Biafra. 1968 2 January to 20 March Second Invasion of Anitsha 31 March, Abagana Ambush 19 May, Nigeria captures Port Harcourt 12 June, Save Biafra media campaign begins in Britain with documentary on ITV and press coverage in The Sun. 17 July, Knesset debates Israeli moral obligations toward Biafran genocide. 2 September, Operation OAU. 15 November, Operation Hiroshima, unsuccessful Biafran attempt to recapture Anitsha. 1969. The 22nd of April, Nigeria captures Umuahia, the new Biafran capital. The 25th of April, Biafra captures Oweri. The 1st of June, Ahiara Declaration. The 29th of August, Jimi Hendrix and Joan Baez perform at Biafra benefit concert at the scene in Manhattan, NYC. The 16th of September, beginning of Agbekoya uprising in Western Region. 
The 25th of November, John Lennon returns MBE decoration to Queen Elizabeth II, 1970 Ojukwu flees. 7 to 12 January, Operation Tailwind. The 15th of January, Biafra surrenders. Topic see also list of civil wars topic references topic bibliography Achebe, Chinua There was a country by Chinua Achebe Penguin Press 2012 ISBN 9781594204821 Chant Christopher Warfare of the 20th Century Chartwell Books 1988 Ibadan University Press 1974 Diamond Larry Class, Ethnicity and Democracy in Nigeria, The Failure of the First Republic. Basingstroke, UK, Macmillan Press, 1988. ISBN 0-333-39435-6 Draper, Michael The First Shadows, Airlift and Airwar in Biafra and Nigeria 1967-1970. ISBN 1-902109-63-5 Dudley, Billy. Instability and Political Order, Politics and Crisis in Nigeria Ajibunu, Hassan Tai, Nigeria's Delta Crisis, Root Causes and Peacelessness, EPU Research Papers, Issue 0707, Stadtschlaining 2007 Ekwe Ekwe, Herbert. The Biafra War, Nigeria and the Aftermath. African Studies, Vol. 17. Lewiston, N.Y., Edwin Mellon Press, 1990. ISBN 0-88946-235-6 Griffin, Christopher 2015. French Military Policy in the Nigerian Civil War, 1967-1970. Small Wars and Insurgencies, 26 1. Heerton, Lassa, Moses, A. Dirk 2014. The Nigeria Biafra War, Postcolonial Conflict and the Question of Genocide. Journal of Genocide Research, 16 2-3. Doi 10.1080/14623528.2014.936700. Kirk Green, A. H. M. The Genesis of the Nigerian Civil War and the Theory of Fear. Scandinavian Institute of African Studies. Research Report Number no. 27. Uppsala Offset Center, A. B. 1975. ISBN 91-7106-085-5 Levy, Zach. Israel, Nigeria and the Biafra Civil War, 1967-70. Journal of Genocide Research 2-3, 2014. Madiebo, Alexander A. The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War. Fourth Dimension Publishers, 1980. Joku, HMA Tragedy Without Heroes, The Nigeria, Biafra War. Anugu, Fourth Dimension Publishing Co., Ltd., 1987. ISBN 978 156 238 2. Ojiaku, Chief Uche Jim. Surviving the Iron Curtain A Microscopic View of What Life Was Like, Inside a War Torn Region, 2007. ISBN 1 4241 7070 2. ISBN 978 1 4241 7070 8. Olawoyan, James Alibi Olabisi. Historical Analysis of Nigeria Biafra Conflict. Master of Laws Thesis Accepted at York University, Toronto, Ontario, October 1971. O'Sullivan, Kevin. 2014. Humanitarian Encounters, Biafra, NGOs and Imaginings of the Third World in Britain and Ireland, 1967-70. Journal of Genocide Research, 16, 2-3. Doi 101080 14623528.2014.936706 Pieri, Bruno 2013 A new entry into the world oil market Nigeria and its relations with the Atlantic powers 1967 to 1973 Unomia Revista semestrale di storia e politica internazionale 1 2 Stevenson John Allen Capital Gains, How Foreign Military Intervention and the Elite Quest for International Recognition Cause Mass Killing in New States. Political Science Ph.D. Dissertation, accepted at University of Chicago, December 2014. Uche, Chibwik. Oil, British Interests and the Nigerian Civil War. Journal of African History 49, 2008. Zumbik, Jan, On Wings of War, My Life as a Pilot Adventurer. 
Topic external links Topic Images Map of Nigerian Civil War Photos from Civil War and Related Events Hosted by Federation of the Free States of Africa Biafra, Iconic Photos Blog, 3 December 2010 Topic Video Daily Life in Biafra and Part 2, Nigerian History Channel BBC Documentary on Nigerian Civil War Biafra Documentary on YouTube, Part 1 and Part 2 Speech by President Ojukwu Surrender Ceremony, 15 January 1970 Major General Goen comments after the war has concluded Topic Writing There was a country, a personal history of Biafra one by Chinua Achebe Omapidan Teslam Real accounts of the Nigerian Civil War 1967-1970 Oldnaja Britain and Biafra, the case for genocide examined by Auburn Wa in The Spectator UK, 26 December 1968 Biafra, a people betrayed by Kurt Vonnegut in Wampeters, Foma and Granfaloons, 1974 Philip Effing II website, writings and links from son of Major General Philip Effing topic Military aspects The Nigerian Civil War, causes, strategies, and lessons learned Short history and assessment of the MFI-9B in Biafran Air Force Service nicknames, slogans, local and operational names associated with the Nigerian Civil War Quick kill in slow motion, the Nigerian Civil War A view of blunders in the Nigerian strategy the Niger Nigerian Civil War, Causes, Strategies, and Lessons Learned Nigeria. Soldiers as Policymakers 1960s to 1970s.